This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. This is Southern Remedy for Women on MPB Think Radio. I'm Dr. Allie Brown, and I'm here today with my co-host, Dr. Michelle Owens. We are that dynamic duo that hosts Southern Remedy for Women every Friday right here on Mississippi Public Broadcasting. And it's so great to be in the studio today. We are talking about hysterectomies or any sort of general women's health question you might have, feel free to call us with questions and comments at one eight seven seven mpb ring That's one 672 7464 And as I said in the intro, Dr. Owens, hysterectomy, because I was doing my research, is the second most common surgery that women have in the United States, about 500,000 women will have a hysterectomy this year. You know what the most common is? I do because I researched it. It's related to, it's also Jay, related do you know? to the uterus. Most common. The most common surgery women have? Don't say hysterectomy. Uh, no, you put me on the spot right it's there. It's a C-section. It's a C-section. I'm actually thinking about doom, that. Doom, doom. I'm See surprised. There? I'm surprised. I don't know. I would think that, I don't know. I would think they're pretty neck and neck, those two. Indeed. Because I, I, well, C-section numbers are coming down. That may be true, but, you, but if you think about it, it, it kind of not, not so much, right? Because you only have one uterus. Oh, but you can have the baby uh, several times. See there. Oh, see what my happened? gosh. That's the whole thing. See there? <gasps> I'm enlightened. Yep. Only can ha- so your hysterectomy only happens once. You know, as a pathologist, you know, <laughs> a pathologist receives um, the specimens that are removed from patients during surgery. And one of the many things we do when we evaluate them, there were some days and are still some days in my practice where I wonder if there are any women walking around still with the uterus inside of yeah, them. There are a lot of hysterectomies going they, down. There really are. Um, you know, it, the, and, and the good thing is that the procedures have been refined, you know, so now we have like minimally invasive hysterectomies as options. So they are, you know, not, while they're still considered major surgery, they can be done in ways that are not as invasive, that allow women to minimize, you know, pain issues that minimize operative time. So the time that you actually have to be on the operating table um, that can minimize um, the surgical scar even because with minimally invasive now you don't have to have a big uh, you know a big laparotomy where you actually open the whole entire abdomen um, there are lots of different uh, operative techniques that have been employed to allow uh, for a hysterectomy which is removal uh, you know of the uterus um, and it may or may not include the removal of the uh, fallopian tubes and ovaries but um, lots of newer techniques that have been uh, better developed over over the years that have given women an opportunity to who, for whom that procedure is needed um, can do so in a way that is a lot less uh, morbid and less difficult um, compared to what it used to be. It's a big surgery it's and it involves a, a considerable amount of recovery. It's Indeed. not just like having a little nip or like a tuck, teeth, right? Not like getting right. your teeth clean. That's right. It's a little bit more than that for sure. Um, but again, we're seeing um, those the the recovery period um, and you know a lot of the other um, more um, negative or um, the unfavorable um, issues being minimized now because of the um, some of the different surgical approaches that can kind of minimize the recovery time and, and other issues related to hysterectomy. So can we go to in a little more detail those different options for surgery? I know that not all women are candidates for the less um, invasive options. So sometimes kind of the more standard operation does still have to be performed. What mm-hmm. determines uh whether you are a candidate for a less invasive option. Well, so so I guess what we'll start off with is, you know, what exactly those less invasive options are. So um, the standard um, hysterectomy would be, as I mentioned, through a laparotomy, which is basically opening the abdomen, so an abdominal incision, which can be 
um, up and down from your belly button, or it can be what people call the bikini cut or through a fan and steel incision or a transverse incision. Um, and again, that's a, that's the, a larger uh, surgery, but it's uh, referred to as an abdominal hysterectomy. When we talk about um, the minimally invasive or the less invasive options, so first of all, you can actually remove the uterus through the vagina. So um, so there's a procedure called a transvaginal hysterectomy. So it's actually the, the removal of the uterus actually occurs through the vagina. Um, you can have a laparoscopically assisted vaginal hysterectomy. So some of that, some of the procedures actually performed using a camera that's inserted into the abdominal cavity and the um, and operating instruments are inserted into abdomen into the abdomen from small ports. So when people think about doing it minimally invasive or a laparoscopic procedure, we can uh, utilize the operative um, the operative instruments from above laparoscopically and then still take the the bulk of the specimen out through the vagina. Kind of what people think about when they have like their gallbladder out or something. They use Yeah, but similar... it doesn't come out through the vagina. <laughs> I mean, putting in the it's ports. Not, not quite the same. Yeah, the, the gallbladder. A transvaginal cholecystectomy. Gallbladder. I've just invented a new I procedure. Like, the gallbladder's <laughs> in the other hemisphere, um, just anatomically. That's not what I we're was not, asking. Yeah, we're not. We don't typically pull that one out through the vagina. There, we can we can get quite a few. If organs your gallbladder out. comes out of your vagina, it might be a problem. That would be a problem. Yeah. And and I would submit to you that if it comes out through the vagina, like while you might need to call your OBGYN, like don't call them first. Go to the emergency room. I think. <laughs> don't call them first. So um, so going back to it, so we were talking about minimally invasive types of hysterectomies. And then there's the robotic hysterectomy, which is really cool. Um, yeah, so Allie's doing the robot dance. Um, Can't not. Yeah, when that's you, so I like. I have to when you say robotic. It's so like 1980s. But um, well, so, so not, I. <laughs> not the actual robot. And it's not performed by like robots like right there's still a human like intervention R2-D2 don't be afraid not, yes R2-D2 it sounds a little weird right yeah yeah but um so there's like a docking station and you so it's where laparoscopic instruments and tools are being used but they are controlled remotely from the actual patient's body so they're being remote controlled by the surgeon in a separate control panel area that can actually uh, perform the surgical procedure. So the robot part is the robotic arms that are used to actually perform the surgery. It's really cool if you had a, a chance to watch it or if you have a chance to like look up some videos on YouTube of, of robotic surgery. Um, but it's it's widely used now, I think, in, in GYN probably more so than in any other specialty, I believe, um, although it definitely has applications in the mm -hmm. in uh, the general surgery world, and our surgical colleagues do use the robot. Urology colleagues use the robot, but um, it's really taken off uh, within a GYM practice, and so that's another minimally invasive way. And so people can have what used to be a really big surgery. They used to have a really big incision in this prolonged uh, period of recovery really condensed down to a place where you just have a couple of little band-aids on your abdomen mm -hmm. and and have a much shorter recovery period. Um, now, recovery from a hysterectomy really depends on the extent of the surgery um, and I think the indications for the surgery to begin with, right, because that sets the tone for, for how big of a procedure or how um, significant of a procedure it's going to be and what the recovery time should be. And then also, it also depends on what's taken out because um, for those women who... Uh, decide or need to have their tubes and ovaries removed as well as their uterus. Um, and there are a variety of different reasons why that may happen. If you are before the onset of menopause or the change of life and you have that happen and your tubes and ovaries are removed, then guess what? You wake up and in addition to having your uterus out, you're now also, congratulations, in menopause. And so it's a surgical menopause where you've actually removed the source of hormones and so there, uh, that creates, while it may solve one problem, then it, may, it will create another one that needs to be addressed because there are lots of additional changes that happen with us within our bodies physiologically um, that have to be addressed as it pertains to the 
instantaneous removal of or cessation of circulating hormones for women. Because, you know, if you're doing menopause, it's like a gradual thing that Mm -hmm. happens. Um, But if it's surgical, then that is it's an uh, basically an instantaneous change. Estrogen drops to zero. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. It just kind of goes away. So whatever is not there at the time when, or whatever is there at the time that your surgery is performed, like there's nothing to replenish that. So once that's gone, it's gone. So the main recovery, uh, the differentiator, well, one of them, I suppose, regarding the size of the incision is because when you make that larger incision, you have to cut through ab- the abdominal muscles, right? I mean, it can't be under under estimated how disruptive that can be. I mean, it's very dip- that's a big muscle area. You use them a lot. Absolutely. Hello. And especially for even for for the people who are listening who had a C-section. Mm-hmm. I think if you've never had one before, that's kind of one of the things that um people can talk to you about it, but until you actually experience it, it's really interesting. Um you recognize how much you need your abdominal muscles to be able to rise from a supine position if you are laying flat on your bed and just things we take for granted, Mm -hmm. how to sit up in the bed and get out of bed in the morning or lifting your knees when you are going from a seated to a standing position and what it takes to lift your legs. Like, so you're, you use your hip muscles, but you also use abdominal muscles to even do things like walking. Um, and so you realize very quickly how important your core is once you've undergone um, significant abdominal surgery and you've had, you know, those muscles either transected or you've had to have an interruption of them or even some denervation or whatever of your abdominal wall. It, you definitely notice the difference. Abs matter. Abs, all abs matter. All abs matter. Indeed. The number is one eight seven seven mpb ring That's one eight seven seven six seven two seven four six four. We're talking about hysterectomies today. Call us with any questions or comments you might have. Would you like to share your previous experience? Are you currently considering with your physician an option of having a hysterectomy? We'd love to hear from you and talk to you on MPB Think Radio. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. This is Southern Remedy for Women on MPB Think Radio. To call the show, dial one eight seven seven mpb ring That's 877-672-7464. Or email remedy at mpbonline.org. This is MPB Think Radio. You are listening to Southern Remedy for Women, where we address issues of health and wellness from a woman's perspective. And today we are talking about hysterectomy. Um, What is a hysterectomy? Who gets a hysterectomy? What types of hysterectomies? Different things that you can expect. If if you or someone you know has had a hysterectomy or is contemplating a hysterectomy, please give us a call. That number is 1-877-MPB-RING. And... Our call screener is here taking your calls, and we will be happy to answer any questions or hear your comments. If you have a special experience that you'd like to share, our ears are open, and we would love to hear from you. And seeing that, we have two calls on the line, so we are going to go to Annie, who's calling us from Boonville. Good morning, Annie. Good morning. What's Um, your question? 
Well, I've had a hysterectomy, and uh, I've got this uh, rectal cell and some other things uh, that's dropped. And so he said that hysterectomy, you know, and having children is what caused this. And uh, I'm on Eloquist, and I was, and I'm having to use a pessary. So I wonder how serious the surgery would be, and what I could expect to go through. So you have, so Annie, just to to recap, so you've already had a hysterectomy. I have. Okay, partial. All right, and so and right now you are. So you're having what it sounds like is some prolapse. Uh-huh. Is that what the term mm-hmm. that they've used? Yeah. So, you know, mm-hmm. that's one of the, and, and it's good that you, thank you for your call, um, because sometimes when women have uh, a hysterectomy, one of the things that um, we always do is make sure that because the supports for the uterus um, provide support to the pelvis as well and also support other structures like the vagina, bladder, etc. So we have to make sure that um, we do suspensory procedures or we actually try to keep those parts in their normal position even though the uterus is gone and what what can sometimes happen is as time goes on so with gravity comes everything else that's that's there so things tend to go in the direction of gravity and you can have that descent or prolapse and so you mentioned that you have a pessary which does provide some support that's actually that's uh, placed inside the vagina to to provide some of that support Um, it is considered a non-invasive option to keep you from having surgery Um, and the type of surgery that would be recommended depends on several things first is you know how how healthy are you overall Um, because the type of surgery is going to be influenced by your overall health. The thing that's going to be safest for you is going to depend on how healthy you are. The next thing is um, what specifically have been identified as the things that are falling, like where the prolapse is most pronounced, because that's going to dictate which procedures are going to be the best for you. Um, So I think what you should do is if there's a discussion or if you're considering surgery, if you're getting tired of the pessary or you really would like something that doesn't require you to have to insert something into your vagina to have that support, then just talk to your um, gynecologist or your urogynecologist to determine what your surgical options are. Because the truth is that we're talking about hysterectomy today, but there are many different surgical procedures that could be offered. And so they really need to lay out the menu, if you will, for you. And that way you can decide along with your surgeon, which is going to be the best option and which is going to best achieve the goal that you want. Okay. Well, I, I'm, I'm 77 years old, and I didn't know if I'd always be able to, uh, you know, insert the pessary. Uh, I didn't know what. I mean, it's no problem with me using it, and yeah. uh, it really helps, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and here's the thing, Annie. Sometimes there are, I mean, there are instances even where um, I have had patients who have been, um, who've utilized pessaries, and they didn't. They either didn't feel comfortable placing them themselves, um, or could not place them. And so all they did was make a trip to me, and I placed it for them. So I think that's really it's great if you have the ability to care for it and provide that care yourself. But for many women, that is a that can be more of a challenge, um, especially for those women who are, are not their own primary caregiver and may not feel comfortable having other people do that. It is perfectly acceptable for you to just schedule an appointment with your doctor and have your doctor place it. Okay. Well, you helped very much. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much. Have a great weekend. Staying on the phone lines, we're going to go to John, who's calling us from Jackson. Good morning, John. Good morning. What's your question? Uh, My question is, I've got a 68-year-old sweetheart, and last week she shared something with me. It was kind of surprising, but I'm glad she did. Uh, She said for about three or four months she's had some vaginal discomfort, uh, itching and a little light bleed, external bleeding, and uh, she did not. She's always tried some home remedies that she got, you know, from Facebook or somewhere. But I told her she needs to go see a gynecologist before it gets any worse, and I just wanted your input. 
So, so John, you are you are absolutely right, and your sweetheart is very lucky to have you. Um, oh. we, so, and you can tell her I said that. Um, so, <laughs> absolutely, um, it's something. And and there are some, you know, mild uh, vaginitis or infections that people have home remedies for that they try. Um, and if if they've worked in the past, that's fine. But I will tell you that any time that there's been there's bleeding, um, I think if you are postmenopausal and you're having bleeding from your vagina, you do need to have somebody take a look at it. Um, based on what you're telling me, it does not sound like something that's really um, overly serious and very well may be a, a quick and easy fix. However, I would say that that's something that you definitely need to have um, evaluated by a, by a trained professional. I don't know how many trained professionals are hanging out on Facebook giving giving great sound advice. Not to say that it doesn't exist, but I would just say that I would definitely yeah. have somebody have her go in, have somebody actually evaluate her, um, and and give her something that could possibly it might be a really easy fix and be quick to um, knock that out so that she has she can start worrying about other things. Absolutely. Well, she has tried uh, several home remedies. Uh, they have not worked, and that's when I said, sweetheart, you need to go see a gynecologist or another professional, and you don't want this situation to get any worse. Absolutely, and there's no reason to suffer even as it currently is, so the gynecologist yeah. no doubt can uh, remedy the situation uh, probably rather quickly and get her some relief. Yeah, and if they, and if they, those home remedies, if they're, if they're not working, don't keep trying them. Go to, you know, go, go to give, give the doctor a try. Give the doctor a try. Thank you very much, uh, and y'all have a great weekend. I appreciate your input. You too. Thanks so much, John. Staying on the phone lines, we're going to go to Donna, who's calling us from Hattiesburg. Good morning, Donna. Hi, how are you? Doing great. How are you? I'm pretty good. Um, I have a question. I am uh, postmenopausal. Um, I've had, in the past, um, I've had a couple of instances of uh, vaginal bleeding and seen my doctor and um, gone through a couple procedures and everything was okay. But I had a recent one and I went to the doctor and I had a um, an ultrasound, vaginal ultrasound, and, um, and they found a growth on my ovary and they did a CA-125. And um, it's within the normal range. But I have a lot of risk factors for cancer. And I'm just wondering if I should talk to the doctor about having a hysterectomy, having everything removed. Um, I'm guessing they're thinking it's a cyst. Um, I don't know. I, I'm just a little bit concerned since I bred up about the risk factors. Yeah, and, um, I mean, definitely, you know, it causes, it provokes a tremendous amount of anxiety when a woman hears that she has uh, a lesion, whether they think it's benign or not, you know, on the ovary, because we know how serious ovarian cancer is. So, Dr. Owens, what are the general, um, um, the, what is the conventional wisdom on prophylactic uh, removal of hysterectomy and, and ovaries and all that. Yeah, so so I think, uh, first of all, Donna, great question. Um, and I also want to bring something else to, to light just as soon as we finish this issue, Allie. So, so having a normal CA-125 is definitely reassuring in the setting of, you know, a, an ovarian cyst. There are lots of cysts that develop on ovaries. And in those women who are, who are still having regular cycles, it's normal to have a cyst on your ovaries. That can be a normal thing. Yeah, just caused by ovulation. Absolutely. Itself, right? For those women who are postmenopausal, when the ovaries stop doing the things that they do, so they're not ovulating, they're not producing eggs, we're not having egg development, um, then that is a, a little bit different. But there are still lots of benign um, or non cancerous um, types of cysts that can develop on the ovaries. Okay, so, so just because you have a cyst on your ovary or have a. a a growth that's identified on the ovary and you're postmenopausal, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's cancer. And your your doctor should look at the ultrasound 
um, to kind of help to determine that. Now, ultrasound's not great for being able to tell you cancer or not, but there are some things that they may see on your ultrasound that may be a little bit more concerning. Um, so the way that the actual uh, cyst looks, um, whether or not uh, what the contents of the cyst has in it, whether or not it is regular and smooth, how, whether or not it's septated, there are all these different things um, that well, we... I, go ahead. I do know I do know that it's septated, and I know that there's no fluid in this cul-de-sac. He said that there's no fluid is good. I don't know if septated, that's divided. I don't know if that's good. Yeah, well, and septations in and of themselves are not necessarily a bad thing. So um, so the septations, I, like I said, there are several different factors that we that we look at to determine the likelihood that it's um, that it's a, that it might be cancer versus not. The size is also another issue. But what I will say is when you're thinking about the concept of uh, whether or not to have a hysterectomy, then you have to consider the risks that go along with having a hysterectomy. And I think that first and foremost, you need to share with your provider about your concerns. So a lot of times people are terrified that, well, you know, not just, well, you found this thing, maybe I should just have everything taken out because I'm really afraid of cancer. But if you have risk factors that you have identified, talk about those things with your physician because just because you have risk factors doesn't necessarily mean it's going to happen, but they should be able to discuss those risk factors with you and tell you an idea of your overall risk and whether or not that really warrants something as extreme as removal of your ovaries and your uterus and your fallopian tubes. There are some instances where absolutely it makes perfect sense and those are recommend and there is actually a recommendation in certain circumstances for women to have their ovaries removed even if the ovaries look normal. Um, but that is not the case for everyone and so those unique special factors that will determine whether or not that's the right option for you are things you need to review with your doctor. And you have to balance the risk of you developing cancer versus the risk of you having a hysterectomy. And some people would say, well, I'd just rather take the hysterectomy. But there are definitely complications that can occur. And you want to make sure that if that's the decision that you choose, that you can deal with the consequences and it be worth it in the end. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I understand that there's risk for the surgery to, uh, as well as the cancer, but um, I'm just trying to figure out what I need to talk to talk to them about. And would I would it be better to talk to uh, a gynecologist who specializes in cancer? A gynec uh, I think they're an oncologist. Yes, a gynecologist. gynecologic oh. oncologist. So they, so what I would say is having that conversation first with your um, with your uh, gynecologist would be the first step. Um, if there is a reason for a like a consultation or a referral to further discuss um, cancer risks, um, then you may choose to have that consultation. Um, but as far as the issue of whether or not you have a hysterectomy or if you um, the decision about whether or not to have a hysterectomy when there is no cancer is typically well within the purview of your general gynecologist and wouldn't have to you wouldn't have to have um, a GYN oncologist to sign off on that. Okay. And, and um, what I've read about the CA-125, it doesn't sound like it's that reliable to rule in or rule out cancer. So that's actually correct. Dr. Dr. Brown gets excited. This is kind of in her path. This is her. I know this is in her pathology wheelhouse. That is absolutely correct. And like the way her 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 ears perked up underneath her her headphones. I'm going to let her kind of oh, chime in on stop. that. <laughs> so that, that's true. A CA-125, it's what we would call nonspecific, right? Um, it, even if it was elevated, uh, it wouldn't indicate that that you have cancer by any means it just shows that there's maybe some inflammation or some sort of disruption within the peritoneum within the lining of of your um, pelvis and abdomen but the fact that it's not elevated is a very good indicator um, that nothing is uh, advanced going on which would go along with what they saw in your ultrasound so it's used in conjunction with it's not a diagnostic test 
the true right. diagnosis of what's going on in your ovary, the gold standard, <laughs> would be going to the pathologist. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> we had- you need the specimen. But, you know, they can make a reasonably effective um, judgment of, of what's going on, you know, by ultrasound. If it looks like it's not suspicious at all and they're watching it, et cetera. Um, but, you know, it's all, again, it's all about um, the, the multiple factors that Dr. Owens talked about and about communicating that with your physician. Do they biopsy these um, growths? Like they can these- remove just the cyst sometimes. Uh, so sometimes they'll do what's called a cystectomy. Well, they remove the cyst and send that to pathology, not the entire ovary, or sometimes they remove the entire ovary. So they don't biopsy it like they do a breast lump? No, 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 no. no, no. Okay. Yeah, and and the and the ovaries are 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 a little different um, in that, too, because if you think about it, a breast biopsy, that's kind of more external, right? It's not inside a peritoneal cavity, so you don't have to um, actually... S- stick something into your your actual body cavity so it's a little different okay. and and what you don't want to do in a person who might have cancerous lesion is to either puncture it if there's fluid in it you don't want to spill that fluid around you don't want to drag tissue that might potentially be cancerous through other areas because all you do is increase the opportunity for seeding or spreading. Absolutely. And, you know, when you're doing that biopsy, you don't know for sure until you get that read back whether or not it's actually cancerous. So it is much more prudent. And when those are done, that it's done surgically, those are typically done open procedures and they um, either remove the whole ovary or they remove the ovary, the tube or what have you. So those things tend to be done like where you want the whole specimen together um, and sent to the pathologist for evaluation. And you want to try to minimize the interaction between that tissue and any other tissues. Okay. All right. Thank you. This has been helpful. Oh, good. so glad, good Donna. Luck to thank you, you Donna. for your call. The number is one eight seven seven mpb ring That's one eight seven seven six seven two seven four six four. We have made it through our calls from this last segment, and our phone lines are open. So call us with any questions or comments you might have. Today we're talking about hysterectomies on Southern Remedy for Women on MPB Think Radio. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Thanks for listening. You are here with us live at Southern Remedy for Women, where we address issues of health and wellness from a woman's perspective. And today, our topic is hysterectomies. Why don't we call them hysterectomies? That should be hysterectomies. I like that hashtag. <laughs> Hysterectomies. Yeah. Because it goes back to, you Go know. Go ahead and trademark it. Good old, I'm doing that. I'm doing that. Good old uh, entomology of words, right? I know. But I just was thinking about Us that. Us women's the way we hysterical. Say and, I, which, and that's what bothers me about it, I think. It's just mm-hmm. like the whole concept of where it came from in the first Histrionic, place. Yeah, hysterical. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Whatever. But anyway, so... Um, the number is one eight seven seven mpb ring one eight seven seven six seven two seven four six four. Our phone lines are open. If you or someone you know or love is contemplating hysterectomy, has had a hysterectomy, or would just like to share your questions or concerns about hysterectomy, please give us a call. We are here and anxiously awaiting to hear from you. Um, so, Dr. Brown, one of the things I was thinking about is that it would be great to talk about um, maybe some of the reasons why people might... Um, be encouraged or might consider hysterectomy. Um, so what what are the, the medical indications or the indications for um, hysterectomy? Um, yeah, because for it being the same organ to remove, there are multiple 
reasons why someone might want to have it removed. You know, in general, if you think about like an appendectomy or a cholecystectomy, you know, getting your gallbladder out of your appendix, most reasons are fairly standard. It's kind of the same. Take your appendix out. Why? Because they think I have appendicitis. Right. But Something that's not the case in hysterectomy. This is true. There are lots of different reasons um, why uh, the discussion may be initiated in you know between a patient and her provider about um, hysterectomy. And you hear a lot of women. I, I feel as we heard with our caller Donna, or you know we've had friends, and I'm sure you've had plenty of patients where the patient actually initiates the discussion because it's something that they are interested in or would like to know more about. And you know, perhaps that's not so true of many other surgical procedures that aren't cosmetic, for example. Right. But but I think, and the other thing is, though, um, which is one of the things that that I have appreciated in my time as, as a, a woman's health provider is this concept of, you know, when things don't go right down there and you're, you know, like from a woman's perspective haha uh-huh. like see what show. i did there see what mm, i did there I but when things don't when when you're having gyn problems like they really can upset your quality of life absolutely in a huge it's very way nagging type of absolutely. thing right and just yeah and it's that annoying kind of persistent thing so whether it's whether it's pain whether it is related to issues of incontinence whether it is Prolapse, where, as we mentioned, where things just kind of start going in the direction of gravity and, and start protruding or, or sagging in places that they aren't supposed to, um, or when you lose that support or have weakening of your pelvic floor muscles. Um, you know, if it's bleeding um, or, or pain, I mean, any number of different GYN complaints. I mean, heck, even for there are people who have issues with, you know, consistent vaginal discharge and they are constantly struggling to get rid of the discharge once and for all. And while that may not be a reason to have a hysterectomy, it's just recognizing that when you're talking about female pelvic medicine and their and all of the things they're in, that that stuff can it really makes a difference and it can influence how you feel about yourself as as a as a woman, how you feel like whether it's your your sexual confidence or whether if you have painful intercourse, just like taking away that part of uh, what is otherwise a healthy relationship, it just can impact you on so many different levels. And so, yeah, there are lots of different reasons. And I can see how and have heard many patients say, just take it all out. Like, I'm, it is. <laughs> I'm done. The, right. This stuff has been nothing but trouble for me for this long. Or if this is how it's going to be going forward, then I just want you to take it all out. Like, I hear that so often. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've heard that from women who are pregnant. Hey, mm-hmm. when I have this baby, can you just... Just yeah, young women, older out. women, yeah, just a lot of out. people have issues. Because yeah. people, it really is frustrating and a big issue for a lot of women. And there's so many different types of complaints and problems that can ultimately, like all of it kind of ends up focusing on different aspects of the female reproductive tract. Absolutely. We have a caller. Lily is calling us from Jackson. Hey, Lily. Hi. Hey, what's your question? Okay. Um I've been pushed in the direction of uh, getting advice to have a hysterectomy done, and I'm kind of confused because I don't know whether to have that done or not. But I've had issues where I've had my left ovary has been removed. Um, I've had my uh, uterine ablation. I had that done. Um, But um, I wanted to ask, um, have you guys heard of anything called referred pain? I keep having severe right side pain, and I've had a vaginal ultrasound and CT scans, and it shows, you know, my uterus enlarged, and um, they said the cyst was on the right ovary now, but it's gone, and I'm just kind of confused because I don't know. It, it's not the pain that I had with the left ovary that I had removed, but it's pain on the upper right side, and I've had it everything else, you know, liver, kidneys, and all that checked out, too. But they keep going back to the OB doctor. So I'm kind of in a 
don't know what to do. Yeah, and I'm uh, sorry. About the history, because I don't know the risk, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And as we mentioned before, you know, it's not a small surgery. It's something to be taken very seriously. Just referred pain in general. Uh, yeah, we've certainly heard of that. That's, uh, you know... The way that nerves work on your skin is that it's very specific. Like if I touch my arm, you know, my forearm near my hand, I'm going to feel it there. But inside of our bodies, it's not quite as clear. So there might be irritation in an area that a certain nerve senses, but then the way that our brain and everything puts all that together, that sensation doesn't always correspond to that specific place. So classically, you know, some people might have um, pain under their shoulder blade if they have gallbladder issues. You know, there's just all these different things. We talk about it when we talk about uh, potential people having a heart attack. We talk about pain radiating down their left arm, right? The pain isn't, there's not actually something happening to their arm. That's the referred pain. So certainly if something's going on in your abdomen or pelvis, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have that pain exactly where the lesion occurs. So Dr. Owens, uh, can you um, uh, speak to Lily's uh, question? Yeah. So first of all, a couple of observations. Number one, you said pushed in the direction of a hysterectomy. And I would submit to you that if you are considering hysterectomy, then that should be something that you should feel like you are walking into voluntarily Mm -hmm. with and, and agree with and not that somebody is trying to push something on you and that may not have been how you meant it but I did hear that when you said it my ears peaked up because I think there are a lot of of people who feel as if sometimes when they go like a provider has a certain idea or plan for them and they kind of feel like it's pushed down their throat and they don't really have an opportunity to share what their concerns are or to consider other options that somebody's really just kind of directively promoting a particular course of action. So that first and foremost. Secondly, you've mentioned you had your left ovary removed, that you also have had um, an an endometrial ablation. And so those two things at least um, show me that, so I'm assuming that you have been having issues or struggling with pain because if you've had the ovary removed and you've also had an ablation, so pain and then also bleeding maybe too, um, because the ablation can could actually serve to address both of those. Um, when you are considering a hysterectomy for pelvic pain, I would say that while a lot of people want to always blame it on the lady parts, it's not always the lady parts. And so there may be things that ultrasounds or CT scans either A, may find or even sometimes may not find. And people will still say, oh, we'll just get a hysterectomy. And a lot of folks who have had hysterectomies for pain are very disappointed when they have this major surgery. They feel a little bit better for a while, and then that pain comes back. So any person who's undergoing a hysterectomy or any surgical procedure just for pelvic pain alone, I would, I would adamantly suggest that you make sure that you've been evaluated for all the other things that happen to be down there in your pelvis. So make sure that they have sent you so that you could be evaluated by a gastroenterologist. Um, Make sure that there's nothing that they are finding as it pertains to your abdominal wall or anything else. Like even though the, the lady parts are there, a lot of times people want to just say, well, that though that because they're there, then that's the problem. problem. Exactly. And once (laughs) those are gone, it'll be fine. And there are lots of people who actually have, had pelvic pain or struggle from pelvic pain and if their pelvic pain is not appropriately worked up and evaluated then you could end up with a hysterectomy and still have that same pain and that's not something that I want for you or for any other woman and I just recognize that that is something that a lot of people have to deal with so just make sure as you are considering it there are lots of other things that could still be causing it even with an endometrial ablation if you have adenomyosis which is where you have glands that are in the uterus that actually migrate through the wall of the uterus and that can create pain. Endometriosis, all of the eosis can create problems um, for women. But if it's endometriosis, then the definitive treatment for endometriosis actually really is removal of the uterus, the tubes and ovaries, and any endometrial implants. And if that is done, that's really considered definitive therapy for endometriosis. So I think getting to the heart of what the cause of the pain is, is going to be your best bet at determining whether or not a hysterectomy is really going to lead you in the pathway of resolution. Okay. Well, that sounds, I've gotten, uh, yeah, a lot of more understanding than what I've had before the call. 
because uh, the uterine ablation thing makes sense now because I've been not bleeding where I could see it. But when I do a urine culture, they'll be like, well, you're bleeding. And, you know, and I, I'm like, I don't know where they're coming from. But, okay, now I understand. And I'll, I'll um, definitely, get, you know, keep checking more things out. Yeah, absolutely. And it, and if you and the other thing is to have somebody if you have blood in your urine, you need to it sometimes it may be that you need a urologist to evaluate that um because there could be something or sometimes a gynecologist or a urogynecologist could um take a look inside your bladder too just to make sure that there's not something else there that might be also contributing to it. Um and like, certainly that pelvic pain can be caused by a chronic irritation yeah. of the bladder. And there are non-surgical options for pelvic pain. There's per- pelvic pain um physical therapy. And so there are definitely some things that could be considered that might help to give you relief or make things better without having to take the leap of surgery until you feel like you've kind of exhausted some of the other options. Okay. Well, thank you, ladies. And I'll say this and I'll get off. Um, I have, that's what confused me because I was like, I don't want a hysterectomy, you know, so bad. But I'm not hurting in the area down below. It's just side pain, you know. So that's why I don't, I don't know exactly where it's coming from. But I would definitely exhaust my options before I leap into what I've been, you know, been pushed into doing. So. Yeah, and think about so your much. kidneys, too, because your kidneys can do that, and they can also lead to a little blood in your urine that could also mm-hmm. be side pain. So, like I said, there's lots of stuff that's down there in the neighborhood. A lot of times people just want to stop at the GYN address, but they don't ever look at the neighbor's houses, and sometimes the neighbors are the ones who are the problems. Yeah. Well, thank you, ladies. I appreciate that information. Thanks for your call, Lily. Have a good day. Best of luck to you. Thanks, Lily, for your call. Bye-bye. Bye. I love that. I don't want to have a hysterectomy right away. I think if you don't, if somebody makes a recommendation <laughs> right. to you that you don't feel comfortable with or that you feel might be putting the cart before the horse, there's nothing wrong with saying, whoa, Nelly, like, absolutely. Pump I mean, the brakes on that's that. That's why I always get kind of, uh, I don't know, I always sort of wonder when people say, oh, I want, I want a hysterectomy so bad. And, you know, if people are suffering, like you talked about, with bleeding or pain and things like that, I, I get that. And, and that, that can be really exhausting. But, any surgery is surgery. And, you know, I tend to want nobody in my belly. Like, leave my <laughs> after birthing this far her children, in life. Nobody in the belly. I, no one got in my belly. Yeah, right. <laughs> Only the children. It's a one way street. But, like, you know, adhesions, you know, there are all sorts of things, unintended consequences that can potentially happen. Um, so I enjoy, um, I'm glad that Lily is. Um, looking into other options to pursue but that that being said hysterectomy is a you know sometimes very necessary and very positive thing in fact frequently five hundred thousand a year well Um, well, i didn't say that all of those are needed but i'm just going (laughs) owens is not going to get on that soapbox because you got three minutes left in the broadcast we'll save that one for that's when you should say just like leave (laughs) they're like Um, oh yeah and they're not needed bye no but seriously um so just real quickly so that people know some of the reasons why women get um, why these 500,000 women every year um, get hysterectomies. We've and, and some of our great callers have already kind of mm-hmm. touched on some of them. Yep. So one is for prolapse. So if, if things are starting to not be supported and not staying in their proper place, then sometimes taking it out is the best, is the best path forward. Um, for uterine fibroids is another one that's really common. So uterine fibroids that, that are benign tumors. I hate saying the word tumor because people always think cancer. Yeah. But benign growths are tumors of um of the uterus um another reason is for abnormal bleeding um and so that encompasses that abnormal bleeding that can be attributable to cancer because of course if you have uterine cancer etc of course those people will get um if they can if they're candidates they could get uh hysterectomies or they find out sometimes that they have cancer Mm -hmm. based on a hysterectomy specimen so um so that and then um let's see prolapse fibroids abnormal bleeding, oh, and pain, mm-hmm. which we kind of touched on just with our last call with Lily. So um, those are kind of the top reasons why people have them. And when I say pain, it's primarily, as we mentioned, um, endometriosis is kind of the culprit where there actually can be resolution um, or definitive treatment for the endometriosis by a total abdominal hyster- or a total hysterectomy, which is removal of the uterus, the tubes and ovaries and any implants. Yeah, it's so amazing how uh, women can have such a diverse array of experience with uh, their menstrual cycles, with menopause, with 
their uterus in general. All you these know, men, all these right. men words, men words, and hysterectomy. <laughs> Why? Why is it called that stuff? Brian? I don't know. Maybe because men named it. I don't know. But um, they did. But anyway, uh, no. But it's true, right? Like yeah. it's it's and and it's strange because while there's such a diverse uh, constellation of um, symptoms or or issues or problems. I think whenever you hear somebody tell a story about one of their GYN complaints, mm-hmm. you can instantly think about three or four of your girlfriends or other Absolutely. people that you know who've had the exact same problem um, or a very similar circumstance. And so I think um, we're we're just awesome. Women are just awesome. <laughs> That's right. Oh, we sure it's are. A thing. We're great. With That's that fun. comes the trade off of being able to have babies, which is awesome. Yeah, you know, and and just to know that there's not really, I mean, that there's still there's still time when when your uterus, um, even if people aren't living in it regularly, like there's still there's still utilization for it. It still serves a purpose. Um, it doesn't automatically. Uh, it's not all over once you've finished your child rearing, um, or and if you've nev- decided never to do it. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. You gonna take us out? Well, hopefully not terminally. Oh gosh, such a pathologist. Oh, well, it's been so great talking today uh, about hysterectomies. Southern Remedy was produced and engineered by Jay White. Our call screener today was Liz Gill. Join us next week for Southern Remedy for Women on MPB Think Radio. NPR's Here and Now is next on MPB Think Radio. Y'all be safe. Be kind.